Hello everyone. Welcome to the module on the nervous system. In this module, we will talk about a very important pathology of nervous system, which is hydrocephalus. So the questions in hydrocephalus can be directly asked or they can come in a situation as a symptom of other diseases. So this is a very important integration with multiple systems as well as the pathologies of nervous system. Okay. So talking about hydrocephalus, hydrocephalus means increase in the CSF volume or the cerebrospinal fluid volume and the dilatation of the ventricles. Okay. So whenever there is an increase in the CSF, which produces ventricular dilatation with or without increase in the intracranial pressure, it is called as hydrocephalus. Is this clear? So this is the primary definition of hydrocephalus. Now there are various types of hydrocephalus which are communicating hydrocephalus and non-communicating hydrocephalus. Let me first talk about communicating hydrocephalus. Okay. So in communicating hydrocephalus, there are two types, which is communicating hydrocephalus and normal pressure hydrocephalus. Okay. Now in communicating hydrocephalus, there is a decrease in the CSF absorption. Okay. There's a decrease in the CSF absorption by the arachnoid granulations. Okay. So the arachnoid granulations are basically present in ventricles to absorb CSF from the ventricles. Okay. I've already discussed about arachnoid granulations in the ventricular system module. So please check that out. Now in communicating hydrocephalus, there is a decrease in the absorption of CSF by the arachnoid granulation. Example in arachnoid scarring post meningitis. Okay. So arachnoid scarring post meningitis and there is an increase in the intracranial pressure, papal edema and herniation. Okay. So it is presented as an increase in intracranial pressure with papal edema and herniation. Is this clear? So this is all about communicating hydrocephalus. We're talking about a very important hydrocephalus that is normal pressure hydrocephalus, which is usually shown up on exams. In normal pressure hydrocephalus, this usually affects the elderly and it is idiopathic in cause. Now, in normal pressure hydrocephalus or NPH, the CSF pressure is elevated only episodically. Okay, so there is not much increase in the CSF pressure. It just increases episodically. It does not result in increased subarachnoid volume. Are you getting me? So it, there is no increase in the CSF pressure. There is barely any increase in the subarachnoid space volume, but there is expansion of ventricles. Okay, this expansion of ventricles, which distorts the fibers of the corona radiata and leads to a triad of symptoms, which are urinary incontinence, gate apraxia, that is magnetic gate and cognitive dysfunction. So these are the three primary symptoms or the triad of symptoms seen in normal pressure hydrocephalus due to distortion of fibers of corona radiata. Now these are urinary incontinence, which leads the person, person to become wet, gate apraxia or magnetic gate, which leads a person to be wobby. And the third one that is cognitive dysfunction, which makes a person wacky. So it is remembered as a wet, wobbly and wacky. Now these symptoms potentially reverse when the CSF is drained by a lumbar puncture. Okay. So whenever a CSF is drained by spinal tap or lumbar puncture, or shunt replacement, the normal pressure hydrocephalus decreases. This is the CT of brain, which shows expansion of ventricles, which signifies normal pressure hydrocephalus. Is this clear? So we have completed communicating hydrocephalus. Now let us talk about non-communicating hydrocephalus. The non-communicating hydrocephalus is usually due to structural blockage of CSF circulation within ventricular system. 
okay so whenever a structure blocks the movement of cerebrospinal fluid in the ventricles it can lead to non communicating hydrocephalus example stenosis of aqueduct of sylvius colloids is blocking of foramen of monro or tumor now please check the ventricular system module before coming to hydrocephalus because it is really important to know about aqueduct of sylvius and foramen of monro so whenever there is a blockage of these cyst or aqueduct then it can lead to blocking of csf circulation resulting in non communicating hydrocephalus so this is the diagram where there is a blockage in the ventricular system leading to non communicating hydrocephalus okay so there is a blockage or a formation of colloidal cyst blocking the ventricular system leading to hydrocephalus am i clear now there is a different type of hydrocephalus which is something like a presentation of hydrocephalus called hydrocephalus mimics that means ex vacuo ventricular megaly which seems like hydrocephalus but is not hydrocephalus okay now there is a increase in the csf on imaging but it is actually due to decrease in the brain tissue rather than any blockage or any reabsorption defect so this is basically due to decrease in the brain tissue and neuronal atrophy which leads to ex vacuo ventricular megaly okay now these are usually present in dementia or diseases that lead to dementia which are alzheimer's disease advanced hiv tics disease and huntington disease okay so these are the primary diseases which leads to dementia and these are formed because of decrease in the brain tissue or neuronal atrophy is this clear the intracranial pressure is normal and the symptoms of normal pressure hydrocephalus that is the triad of urinary incontinence magnetic gait and cognitive dysfunction is absent in ex vacuo ventricular megaly now talking about the ct of ex vacuo ventricular megaly there is a decrease in the neuronal tissue can you see this there is a decrease in the neuronal tissue leading to ventricular megaly so this is all about a very important topic of nervous system pathology that is hydrocephalus thank you for watching this video If you enjoyed the video please click on the like button and do subscribe to this channel let me know in the comment section below which topics do you want me to explain thank you